It is October 13th. Um, this is the Heritage Preservation Commission meeting. Emily, could we please get a roll call? Yes. Um, Commissioner Longquist? Here. Commissioner Pollack? Here. Commissioner Birdman? Here. Commissioner Woodmire? Dara, I see you're with us. Yeah, there, Dara's here. Um, Commissioner Nemo? Here. Commissioner Everson? Here. Not logged in yet. Um, Commissioner Hassenstab? Here. Um, student member Maheshwari? Here. Student member Lee? Uh, here. Student member Pronley? And Chair Schilling? Here. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. uh, the first order of business tonight is approval of the meeting agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. A second? Second. Emily, can we get a roll call for the approval of the agenda, please? Yes. Commissioner Longquist? Aye. Commissioner Pollack? Aye. Commissioner Birdman? Aye. Commissioner Woodmire? Aye. Commissioner Nemo? Aye. Commissioner Hassenstab? Aye. Chair Schilling? Aye. Thank you very much. Uh, the next order is approval of the meeting minutes from our September 8th meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes as submitted? Some Second. Second. Emily, can we get a roll call to approve the meeting minutes for September 8th? Yes, Commissioner Longquist. Aye. Commissioner Pollack. Aye. Commissioner Birdman. Aye. Commissioner Woodmire. Aye. Commissioner Nemo. Aye. Commissioner Everson. Um, Commissioner Hassenstab. Aye. Chair Schilling. Aye. Thank you very much. That brings us to the next segment of this meeting tonight, which is our reports and recommendations section. Uh, before we begin in depth on um, the three submissions proposed to us, I just want to acknowledge that um, we received quite a bit of correspondence through a number of different uh, avenues. We received correspondence through the Better Together website uh, we also received correspondence through email as well as voicemail, and uh, all of that correspondence was shared with the commissioners on this commission. The first uh, before us is a COA for 4510 Sunnyside Road. Emily, can you take us through that, please? Yes. All right. Um, a 4510 Sunnyside Road is located on the north side of Sunnyside, east of Browndale Avenue. Um, and the home was built in 1941 and is a story and a half American colonial revival style. The certificate of appropriate request in front of you tonight in includes a change to the table on the front facade of the existing home and a small entry addition. The proposed project also includes interior remodel and addition off the back of the home, um, which you do not see from the front facade. Um, the changes to the gable and the addition to the front entry are visible from the street facade and that is those are the reasons um, why the proposed project requires a certificate of appropriateness request. Hold on just one second. Sorry, I'm gonna pause here um, one second i'm getting a knock on my door from the preservation or from the parks commission 
if I can help them quickly, if that's okay. That's the curse of working from your office. If she had been working from home, that wouldn't have happened. I suppose when the parks department knocks, you answer. I mean, it is the parks department. Exactly. I apologize for that. Um, one of the perks of working from City Hall tonight. So I will start over if that's all right with you guys. All right, so um, like I said, 4510 Sunnyside Road is located on the north side of Sunnyside Road, east of Browndale Avenue. The home was built in 1941 and is a story and a half American colonial style home. The COA request in front of you tonight includes changes to the existing gable on the front facade of the home and a small entry addition. The project also includes an interior remodel and an addition off the back and the addition off the back is not visible from the front facade. The changes to the existing gable and the addition to the front entry are visible from the street and that is the reason why the certificate of appropriateness request is in front of you tonight. Consultant Vogel reviewed the submittal and um, has noted that the changes should have minimal impact on the property's historic character, that no historically significant architectural features will be lost. Um, the design of the proposed new dormer is appropriate to the building and to the streetscape, and the important architectural character defining features are to remain. Um, consultant Vogel recommends approval of the COA request um, and staff agrees with um, Consultant Vogel's evaluation of the proposed plans at 4510 Browndale, or excuse me, 4510 Sunnyside Road, recommending approval of the COA request. Um, the only condition for approval is that any changes to the proposed plans would have to come back to the Heritage Preservation Commission. And with that, I can stand for any questions and the applicant is also on the call. Do I have any commissioners with questions? Would the homeowner like to add any input here? Hey, oh, yes, question. go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm wondering what exactly you're doing to the front entryway. I looked and looked and couldn't see what the changes were as proposed. I understand the gable, but the front entry, you said there's a small addition and is it, like a couple steps there, I can't yeah. quite understand. Okay, and I apologize if my dogs chime in, they like to talk when I'm on the phone. So the front entry, we were not changing the footprint at all. It's just where the uh, stoop is, we're enclosing it with glass and then pushing the door out. Um, and the glass will be a leaded uh, diamond pattern glass to match what we're doing in parts of the home for the addition. Okay. Does that make sense? I can yeah. I can also share screen and bring up the 3D model if that helps too. Actually, oh, no. if you really look at the depth of the door, you can now see when you're paying attention to that, you can now see the difference that's in there. Okay. Emily, would you mind switching switching back over? Sure.
Oh yeah, I see it coming out. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Starr. Anyone else? Annie, I have a quick question. Go ahead, Commissioner Lundquist. Um, just for the architect, the, I think it's agree very minimal plan. I'm just curious, how deep is that window box on the new larger gate element that seems I think it's fine, but I would just like to hear more about the depth and the thought behind it. The recessed box. One second, if you hear the dog, give me a second. <laughs> we appreciate dogs and children, it's fine. This might be your first dog join, joining in on your meeting. Um, the depth of that is 18 inches, and we're not trying to have it look modern. And the reasoning behind that is um, the existing dormer. And if we go back to maybe the existing uh, image of the house, uh, it shows that it, it just doesn't fit in with the architecture style of the neighborhood. And in order to keep that wall and those windows where they are, granted, we are replacing the windows, and to not impact that bedroom on the second story, we plan to uh, fur out from where that is in order to get our peak to match the other existing peak, uh, the slopes in the home, and not hit the ridge of the existing roof. Does that make sense? Thank you. Okay. I have another comment. Hi, Go ahead. Um, so I live exactly across the street from this home. Uh, okay. I look at this home every single time that I do the dishes, uh, which is every night. Uh, and I think that you have done an amazing job uh, with this property. I think that uh, you are really setting a standard of how to respect what is there and modernize it. Um, and I'm really excited about the project as much of a headache as the construction is going to be. Uh, I think it looks beautiful and, and it's a great proposal. I really like the minimal impact uh, to the street facing facade and the, all the stuff that you're doing behind the home. Um, I studied it carefully um, over the last couple of days and it looks uh, quite wonderful. So I'd applaud your efforts in this one. Thank you so much, Mark and team. Thank you. Chair, I'd like to move to approve the COA as submitted. Thank you for the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, Emily, can we please get a roll call vote? Yes, Commissioner Longquist. Aye. Commissioner Pollock. Aye. Commissioner Birdman. Aye. Commissioner Woodmeyer. Dara, we didn't catch that. Okay. Um, Commissioner Nemo. Um, Commissioner Everson. Yeah. Commissioner Hassenstab. Aye. Chair Schilling. Aye. Okay, with that, the that certificate of appropriateness is passed. Now I just have to um mention that with the passage of this certificate of appropriateness, there is a 10 day delay uh, for the period of appeals. Any appeal made to this will go in front of city council. After that 10 day period, uh, the planning department can proceed forward. Thank you so much. Uh, Emily, I just got a note from Commissioner Everson. Um, he needs the links to this meeting sent to him again, if possible. I just sent them, um, so he should be logging on shortly, as long as okay, thank you. Getting. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's move to our next uh, COA, which is 4634 Edgebrook Place. And Emily, I'll let you go ahead. Yes. Um, 4634 Edgebrook Place is located on the south side of Edgebrook Place. The existing home is a two-story residence that was built in 1951. The certificate of appropriateness request includes the demolition of the existing home with the intention of building a new home within a garage 
that meets the district's plan of treatment. The existing home is not classified as a historic um, resource since it was constructed after the district's period of significance, um, which tonight then the demolition is not the issue. Um, the certificate of appropriateness request is for the construction of a replacement home, which is subject to the HPC review and approval. The proposed replacement home is contemporary with colonial revival influence. Two-story home with a three-car side load garage. The proposed height of the replacement home is just under three feet and is compatible with the height of the existing home and homes on surrounding properties. You can see the proposed building materials include white painted brick, um, cedar shingles, and a white painted or a painted brick chimney. The review process for a replacement home for a non-historic home in the Country Club District includes two steps. Um, the plans in front of you tonight are fulfilling the consultant Vogel has reviewed the proposed home and um, believes that the home would not look out of place and relative to its surroundings and it would not detract from the historic integrity of the properties, adjacent properties or as the district as a whole. Um, the proposed plans in front of you tonight would be considered infill construction and not the replacement of a historic home. Um, staff tonight recommends that the HPC provide the applicant with any feedback on the proposed plans and identify any desired changes. The applicant will then take into consideration those comments um, when drafting final plans, which would then be presented PC at their November meeting. You can see um, the proposed elevations here. Um, the applicant um, included a comparison drawing showing the proposed height, the height of the existing home and height of surrounding properties. The proposed project does meet the city's zoning requirements. So as you can, this is the survey submitted with the application and the applicant has also provided a landscape plan for your review. With that, I have any, I can stand for any questions and the applicant is also on the call. Commission, go ahead, Commissioner Lundquist. Um, Emily, I have a question on the height, which you explained mm -hmm. is compatible, and we can see in this. Can you remind us, please, um, what is compatible? What's the allowable variance from neighboring properties, both by the rules and in this instance? What is the difference that looks like the new proposed home will be a touch taller? So, how much above the neighbors and is allowed is what I'm wondering. I don't have the height of the existing home. The applicant might have that um, on the plans and I don't have the height of the surrounding properties, but um, the applicant can speak to that potentially. Um, the height meets the, of the proposed home meets the zoning requirements. Um, this is a very wide lot. So the um, house would be able to be taller per the zoning code, um, but the applicant can speak to um, the comparison or how much taller the new home is to the existing. And before I see my other question, which is maybe going to be more for the commissioners as well as the applicant, the only thing that jumped out to me that I'd like to discuss is that if I'm correct on my terms, the eaves um, are slightly angled underneath the three front facing gable in particular. And um, to me, that seemed a little modernistic, less traditional. And so that's just a point I wanted to flag for discussion for the group. Is that feature clear? Am I, am I referencing it correctly? The architects can help me. Are you talking about like the, the brick corbels that are kind of on the, yes. the corner to make the eave look? Thank you, Thank you Sarah. And they look, you see a, a dramatic corbel on the far right entry with a, but they're not appearing to be corbeled to me. They, maybe I'm just not seeing the detail. So. And I guess clarification on that would be, Right. Clarification on that would be good. Is that just at the, the facade and then it it goes to kind of a, a flat soffit behind it? Or does that um, kind of angled piece carry on for the whole stretch of the, the building? The homeowners or architects are welcome to chime in with a, an answer to those questions. TJ, do you want to share on that? Uh, 
It looks like it's just a, like a corbel on the side. If you look at the side elevation, you kind of see that. Um, Emily, if you can pull up a, a left elevation. Can the commission hear me okay now? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Having some issues with my microphone. Um, I'll speak first to the to the height uh, question by Commissioner Lundquist. Uh, we're approximately two feet over the ridge line of the existing home, uh, which puts us roughly about the same to the home on the uh, street side left. I don't have the dimension of the ridge height for the street on the uh, for the home on the right side of the street there, but we are approximately two feet over the ridge line of the existing house. Uh, to speak to the eave and the brick corbel detail, that is a consistent detail on the eaves. It is only a few bricks deep, and then behind that corbel detail, it steps up to a, uh, a typical soffit eave condition. And then the larger bracket that the commissioner referenced over the side entry, that's actually a wood bracket detail. So that's not a, a brick corbel detail at all. That's just a wood bracket that goes out to catch that loop line as it comes down. Thank you. Commissioner Lundquist, does that answer your question? It does. Um, I guess I would just be curious as the others chime in. I think overall the plan is just beautiful and reflects the changes we talked about. And maybe I just didn't notice those brick corbels. And they would probably read beautifully from the street. The rendering just seems sort of modernistic at this angle. But I defer to the architects and others in the group. Does anyone else have question or comment? Sure, Charlene. Yes. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, Commissioner Hausenstab. I believe last time we had a question about the glass in the front. It seems uh, like a lot. Wasn't there a takeaway for either Nate or TJ to address that large window? And I'm not sure if it had changed from last time. I can't exactly tell. Was a slight change that we made in the proportions of the window pane sizes themselves, but the overall uh, window treatment of that pane glass window did stay as not kept all house. But we did downsize the the pane proportions within that window. So how big is that window? Is it over eleven feet wide? Uh, let me check the drawings real quick. I don't believe so. Let me get the check. I'm scaling at almost, yeah, 11 and a half feet. Okay, one moment here while the cat file opens up. So, yeah, so 11, 11, six and three quarters is that width for that window and then the height is seven feet. And then TJ, while you have the drawings open, can you just tell us on the garage, uh, I guess the extent of that flat roof that covers the garage, just how, uh, how deep is that flat portion of the garage? The flat portion going all the way back to the base of the dormer above it is about seven and a half feet deep. Okay. One one thing we did, and to get back to Commissioner Hassenstab's point regarding the windows, we uh, looked at different windows throughout Country Club, and there were a significant amount of them that had the uh, larger plate glass windows um, as an element of the home. So we felt like that it was consistent with the the you know various homes in the neighborhood. So that's why we left it as as planned. So seventy seven square feet, Nate. I'm not. I don't know the exact size. Of uh, that's I, I know all the homes quite well, and it seems aggressive. I believe in our in the uh, brochure that we submitted along there were some exemplary images as well. And I don't think that there was any kind of a size limitation to some of these stained glass windows. Um, again, I, we did change the proportions of the panes themselves just so they didn't feel modern in any way whatsoever. Uh, but this is a nice relief on the facade of the house just to get more glass in there. I think that uh, I think that's something to just 
to relook at it with it being so front and center and so large. I think there there is room for a large picture window at the front of the house. This is this is just really large and out of scale with what what is appropriate for the neighborhood. Commissioner Schilling, I have a quick question. Go ahead. So as I look at this, uh, I'm 99% positive of the answer. We talked about it last time, but just confirming that there are no uh, entry and exit doors under that second floor porch. That plan hasn't changed, correct? Correct. There are no egress doors to that, that front uh, terrace detail. Thank you. Does anyone else have comment or question? Uh, sure, Shelly. Go ahead. Back to what Commissioner Longquist mentioned, I'm just looking at slide page, what page am I on here? Page 37 in the packet. And I see that uh, corbel on the right overhanging. Can you explain that from an architectural perspective, why that's happening? It seems kind of odd, a really odd feature. Um, can you clarify which one you're, you're speaking of? Yeah, so street facing right, yeah, it looks like there's a side door going into the three car garage there. Right. With the wood, he said it was a wood corbel, and the, the rest of the second floor appear to be brick. Can you explain why you chose that element? It just seems out of place. It's an architectural detail and a feature it's wood horrible, but that is not brick above it. That's actually a left siding product that uh, I was talking about the second floor, like by the window to the right above the window, you can see the brick. I understand that it's the left siding. I'm sorry, Commissioner. I'm speaking of that the large wood bracket that goes out that the the lantern is hung from. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was that was just an architectural detail and a larger, you know bracket element that was to catch that roofline coming down and just do it in a very decorative way. Uh, we didn't feel like putting some kind of a corner post or a post down system there uh, was the appropriate piece to do. But this was just a way to show that there was something going out there to capture that structure. Okay, and can you speak to the columns? Have the columns changed since the last iteration of the plan? They're holding up the knot deck. The knot deck, yes. The uh, the columns, I don't believe, have changed in their size or proportions. I don't have the old version in front of me right now, uh, but those are actually scaled for the proper dimensions and height. I don't know. I'm just kind of getting a slippery slope towards a much more contemporary home than the neighborhood feels. They would support. That's just my opinion. Again, I'm no architect, but because of the colony, that's a concern. Uh, noted. I'm not. I'm not sure what to do with that. I think columns are certainly prevalent throughout the country club community. I don't really know how to react to that one. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Mark, are you talking about the the front columns on the front facade that hold up the the, the porch or yeah, the portico? Thank you, yeah, thanks. Or are you Maya. talking about the um? Are you talking about the like the railing on the on the second, not deck deck? <laughs> the columns. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think those are a very traditionally detailed column. Um, you know, traditional. Traditional architecture definitely kind of in in this sphere. Um, so I guess I I I'm not seeing kind of the modern. Uh, it's a very crisp, detailed house, so it it does kind of ride that edge. Um, I guess another thing to just look at is the size of that deck, non-deck railing, and the scale of that because it's looking like it is. Um, it it's looking like it's meant to be a guardrail at this point at that scale. So just think about the height of that. 
because if it's because if, right now as as the you know as an architect and i see as kind of non-architects people are questioning if that's a deck or not and i think that's that's a um i think that's a, a concern because we have talked about precedent before about not having decks on the front of houses and um while there's no door out to it the scale of the of the space created by that area and the height of that railing um you know as at a quick glance it looks like occupiable space yeah fairly noted i i do want to call out that the sizing of that is somewhat built off of a traditional detail with the entablature height based off of those columns the railing would be something that was found on any type of colonial home with uh proper you know stoop entry portico space um you know it's i guess we talked about this last time too and the lack of a door makes it a non-functioning deck space. So, you know, lowering, right. lowering that that railing would just make it feel unproportional to what's happening below it. We can certainly look at that again, but you know, it's not a, a code. Um, it, it does not meet code as far as the fall guard railing at all. It's right, and and I mean, understand where we're coming from. We know this is a beautifully designed house. It's traditionally detailed and our question is is it appropriate for for the country club so while while elements might feel like they are uh uh kind of calling from historic architecture we also have to have that layer of uh kind of the appropriateness of of the district too so i, I hear you but i'm also saying let's layer in kind of what we see in country club as well is there a possibility, uh, you know, Sarah, as you were talking about of sort of reducing the height of that non deck deck uh, rail so that it's apparent from the streets as well that that's a decorative element and not a useful element of the house. TJ, I don't know if you can opine on that. Uh, you know, again, it's it's proportioned out based on the entablature and the column height below it, or what would be the entablature proportions. You know, lowering that that railing to uh, you know 18 inch dimension would quite honestly look like an architectural mistake. It would just be a matter of it would be you know a, a cap rail that would not feel in proportion whatsoever to the facade of the house. Uh, if the intent is just to make it look like it's not a terrace space up above. That seems to go against wanting something that's also traditionally detailed and, and architecturally significant for that proportion. I think we're just asking for you to take a look at it. Uh, right now, it's about three feet in height. You know, eighteen inches with half that. I guess we're not asking for that, but maybe just just look at those proportions a little bit. That's that's what I guess the takeaway is here. We certainly will. Is there any other feedback? Yeah. These plans? May I see something? Go ahead. So I've been going back and forth and looking at this and trying to find out like what what something about it just sticks out at me that just doesn't work. But I, I'm trying to figure out what's the right thing to say. There is something about that wooded um part that's under the, the um the, the wooded bracket underneath the overhang of the of roof line on the garage side you've got on the left hand side of the of the house on the main floor you've got the window treatments that are there that are you know broken up and so on and so forth and then on the right hand side it just kind of like is the this bracket that's sitting there it's kind of I don't know. I don't know why that, that sight line just bothers me. I don't know. I don't, I don't have a great recommendation for it, but like there's just some, I don't recall seeing something like that um, as I've driven around the neighborhood that I've seen something that's that sort of unweighted on one side from that standpoint. And I know, um, you know, Mark mentioned that and I just kept looking at that. I'm just like, I'm just troubled by it. And I wish I had a better thing to say about what I thought you could do with that, but that well, why would you introduce? Sorry, Commissioner Berman. Why would you introduce the lap siding in one triangle of the facade, where I see brick, uh, brick or cedar shakes on the left hand side, and then all of a sudden there's lap siding? It just seems out of place. I mean, I 
mean, I get that there's a depth issue there, right? There's a little bit of a, that's not the, is it the same depth as it is on the left side of the house? No, there, there is some asymmetry between those two. I mean, the, there's a deeper step back there. Yeah. Um, you know, and the, and the reason for the material change to the left siding, which does come back again around the corner on the gable over the garage loop, is just because brick would feel uh, inappropriate with such a heavy mask being supported by uh, a horrible detail made of wood. So there is a reason for that material were, in that location. Were there any other options as far as instead of having the wooded support mechanism is there was there any other thoughts as to what else you could have there that maybe it's not something that just you know rises up as that supporting bracket but is there something else that could go there that would not have that break as again i wish i had a great suggestion i really don't have one um so i hate to say something negative and then not have a suggestion it, it it's the only thing on this entire plan that i'm seeing that just grabs my attention the wrong way um, I appreciate what everyone's saying about the faux porch on the top side, whatever it is, and I get what you're saying about that, and and I'd probably be okay with what that is, but for some reason on that part, on this right side where the garage is, I don't know, and I, I wish I had an architect's mind because I don't have one, um, so I wish I could give you more, but there's just something about it. I was curious if anyone else besides Mark and I has any other comments about that. If most well, people are fine with it, then I'll thought. just retract what I said. And I agree with you, Michael. I'm just wondering, is it the mass of it, maybe, that's bothering you? Not necessarily the material change, but the yeah. mass of it, you know, and maybe the roof line, like it maybe Yeah, be I think it is the roof line and the massing of the of the of the of the wood bracket component. Um, I mean I have some of those on my house myself, but they're not that wide. So yes, I th I think you're right. That is part of it. So perhaps if it was more similar to the other side of kind of to the left of the front door and it was a brick um kind of a, a brick expression instead of the lap siding and it landed on columns that might feel kind of a little kind of less um yeah I mean, it's, cer it's certainly it's certainly playful and it's it's a surprise but it is a really big bracket i guess um that's that is to, to I mean, ironically what i'm th i mean the thought i don't know about the the column because i know tj mentioned that before I'm not so sure a column would necessarily work with that, but almost like again on the left hand side, because you've got the window treatment. So you got, you know, there are different depths. The windows are kind of there. It almost begs again from a from a symmetrical stand, not an asymmetrical standpoint. It almost seems like if you had a even if it was a partial wall that it was it had a window or two in it, even though it has no functional purpose, it would sort of clean that that scale up that I think Dara is kind of pointing out to me. But again, I don't know if that's a great idea either. I, I'm, I don't know. I'm just, I, I feel bad that I'm even saying it because I wish I had something better to say. I'm just curious to see if anybody else feels this way. I wonder if it's the the asym the asymmetry that's making it feel modern, in addition to the exaggerated bracket. I feel like that might be, if there was more of an attempt to create. A symmetrical echoing back to the other side that might feel less incongruent yeah i mean i'm looking at the actual main level floor plan i'm just trying to get a sense of like where the garage doors are so what we're seeing in your rendering um sorry one second let me come back to it the, the the little window and the little you know window treatment that's off the window where the cars are that's actually the the start of the garage itself so we're seeing the garage as we look through this but there's this overhang from the roof line with the bracket so you can get that side door that's there right yeah it it almost seems to me a bit like why doesn't the rest of the building just kind of meet it out front like that rather than having this open space. It just, I think that's what's throwing me off. And I'm not saying that's what you should do. I'm just saying that's what's throwing me off because this bracket is so big. And while the material, I hadn't thought about that until someone said it, I agree that that does kind of throw it off again from an asymmetrical standpoint. So, I mean, I, ironically, I'd almost rather you see you extend the, you know, something out 
to bring the depth forward um, from that, I think that would actually make it better and, leave, and keep the material the same. Then you wouldn't need a bracket like that, but I don't know how much that adds to the cost or whatever it is, but that almost seems like it would be better than what I'm looking at here. But I don't take it for that's one person's opinion. I'm not, I wouldn't turn it down because of it. I'm just saying it definitely makes me pause. Sorry, I can't give you more than that. Commissioner Birdman, I don't think you're the only one that has taken issue with this. Commissioner Lunk was brought it up immediately. And I, I'm going to echo the same thing. It does feel, um, it does feel like that's one specific element that is a bit jarring in terms of its traditional look. Like for the record, that corbel was actually not the one. I don't have a problem with it. It was more the corbel brickwork that caught my eye. I think that entry um, does not bother me. I'm totally fine with that design. And I have seen some similar large in some features in country club. Um, so my vote okay. would not be there. Thank you for the clarification. I appreciate that. Sure, Shirley. I'd like to go back to the portico. I'm just looking at the floor plan and it looks like it's going to be 10 and a half by almost 22. And I recall the home on Country Club and Drexel on the corner that we took significant issue with their portico and they reduced it accordingly. It just seems very large. And I don't know if there's a standard in the neighborhood that would support a 220 square foot, uh, not deck, portico, front porch, whatever we're calling it. It, it just doesn't seem to fit. Okay, thank you for the input. Commissioner Schilling, I would, uh, I would offer Mark to me that reads somewhat like a veranda that's on many homes. I know there's a house on Browndale with a large porch and because it's recessed and flush with the rest of the house, that's not problematic to me. The, the Drexel and Country Club issue was because that was <clears throat> with the uniform setback and sight lines from the streetscape. And I think that's why we were pushing for the recess there. This one, because it's not extending as much as I'm reading it. I don't know. I could be wrong, Mark. I should have a question for Emily, if I may ask really quick about this, even though there are no uh, doorways that are built into this and so on and so forth. Would code from the city prevent them from a safety standpoint of actually having anyone actually out on there after it's built? Are you talking on the second floor, Michael? Yes. There would be building code um, requirements for like the height of the railing. There would obviously be different load requirements if there's actually going to be people out there. I can't speak to directly what those would be. Um, TJ might be able to speak to that better. Or Sarah, one of the architects, just that's what they're, they do. Um, but there would be other requirements if it was actually a usable space. Right. No, I, I get that there would be different requirements. What I mean is, is that if well, let, let's just say they decide to build it, whatever it is, and it, it, whether it meets or doesn't meet those, but the homeowner after it's built, right? Because the architect's not going to be around anymore and the builders aren't going to be around anymore and whatever it is, and then people decide to then go out onto there. I think what I'm hearing from the group is that even if we could tolerate sort of the scaling of it and where it's positioned and so on and so forth, but knowing that it's not designed to be used that way, the homeowner, after it's all said and done, could they still go out there and do that? Um, I think there are people who would be concerned that if they came by driving two years from now and they saw, even if it wasn't any furniture or anything like that, but there were people up on there <laughs> doing stuff, that would kind of then confirm what I think some of the concerns are right now. So I'm just asking, like, would that be a violation of something to where, if, you know, from a safety standpoint, that if someone saw that and complained about it, that they're technically, I know it seems silly to even say it, but I'm just, I'm not as concerned about it, but I get I get why someone would be concerned. This all of a sudden started to become usable space after this is all said and done, even if it wasn't to code. 
I think that's what people are worried about that it doesn't perceives that it's then okay. Um, it would likely become a building code issue at that point, but it would be similar to if someone had a climbed out a window and was hanging on the roof type, type of a thing. Um, but um, I would imagine it would then become a building code issue if they try to create usable space out there, there'd be other requirements. If it's someone that's just out there um, exploring or, you know, using the space, then um, I'd imagine if we'd get a call on it, um, the building official might go out and take a look or look into it. Um, I can't directly speak to that. I ha don't have, um, like I said, I don't know that those requirements are what he would be looking for. Yeah. Um, well, I have a sort of follow on question to, to that point, which is, uh, you know, a, another owner from now um, wants to, you know, turn one of those windows into a door and, you know, alter that railing to be code compliant. What's the process to go ahead and do that? Uh, a building uh, permit, um, would they have to come back to this commission to make that change? You know, that's what concerns me is that uh, some future owner might try to actually reclaim that space as a second floor porch, if you will. And I and think, I think, I think that's actually what Michael said and kind of Rachel, you're taking on. I think the perception of being able to occupy that space is what is giving me pause on on that element. And it, it's not whether or not it's code compliant or can it meet the loads or not. It's just the perception of it that I think uh, maybe sets a precedent that we don't want to do because you're right, Rachel, the next homeowner could uh, get a, a remodel permit for a non street facing facade and put a uh, put a door in there and then then there is an occupiable deck up there. Um, so if they, you know, alter the railing, uh, then yes, it would have to come back in front of the commission. But, uh, you know, technically, if it's not a street facing facade, which there are kind of perpendicular walls to the street, they could. Just to play the devil's advocate, but but wouldn't wouldn't they have to uh, go before the commission with the railing because the railing is not code compliant? Uh, yes, and I guess that's uh, that's so I'm, they I'm, they would have to. But I guess the the bigger question is is the perception of being able to occupy that that space. I think your um, homeowner would want to do with, with that space to be design intensive for it to be more design intensive for it to be more of a an architectural decoration off of the side of the house. The recess there is intentional to highlight the gable shapes. Um, we also just don't need that space on the second floor for more square footage to pull the facade out to match up with what's happening below it. So it is an intentional recess there that just highlights the two gables that are flanking it. Um, the intents and purposes of that is not a terrace, it's not an outdoor space, it's not going to be designed structurally for any kind of a live load or, uh, you know, new stone patio in any kind of the future. I cannot speak, nor should the commission really think about what the next homeowner does to it, because they would still have to come back before you for any kind of a renovation permit, correct? Correct, but I guess TJ, what we're saying is that it, it it's the perception of that you could occupy it, whether or not it meets code or not. It's the perception of it is what what we're saying. Uh, the, but the perception of any you know widow's peak or widow's walk over a front portico is that it is accessible space, even though it's typically a window that would lead to it and not necessarily a door. And those you know widow's walks are somewhat common throughout country club, but not at this scale, not at the at, at this size. I, I want to just be clear that I'm not questioning the intent at all. Like, and, and I want to make sure my comments are clear. I'm not questioning your intent or the current homeowner's intent whatsoever about what you want to do with that space. Not at all. And I think your your explanations are well grounded as to why you've done what you've done and so on and so forth. And I don't have a problem in general with that. It's more, but as I'm trying to put a a, 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 a bow wrap around what I think I'm hearing from the other members of the commission is that because of other things we've seen in the country that have come before this group, especially over my tenure of it, 
we've had plenty of people have tried to come to try to figure out how to use a space like this as usable space. And so we're, we're balking, not denying, but balking at the possibility of, well, where does this take us going forward? And whether that's fair or not to your applicant, I get that. But at the same time, we're trying to figure out the overall component of the district. That's why I think you're hearing this pause. Um, so that's where we're going to, we're, we're having a hard time, I think, finding a, a, an acceptable bridge <laughs> at the moment to this. And I think that's just something to not discount too much. Um, I, I would, I would submit two things. One is this property is one of the widest, if not the widest in country club. So the horizontal nature of the, the structure and the width of the lot um, in some influences the scale of that and the size of that and the horizontal nature of that railing. And then the second thing is, I would say, the decorative element. Losing that element to it takes the detail down and I would say the historic aspect of the detail down significantly. And so I think I understand your the idea behind perception I would ask, given the the type of property that this is from a scale perspective, and also just the historic nature of the decorative element, um, I I would submit that it actually supersedes the concern that you guys have. Well, then, then I'd ask one more question either to Emily or to Chair Schilling. Um, if we if we when, when we came time to actually make this decision and assuming that we would approve. Um, the plans as submitted or with any other alterations other than for this, whatever we're going to call this thing, we'll call it part X. Um, could there be something that's put into the COA that tries to address our concerns about it that wouldn't deny them to do it, but at least tries to set the tone for the commission's view of these types of structures within the district and noting what Nate just said about the unique elements of this particular property that then we could try to minimize the impact of a potential precedent or, or directional guidance towards, oh, these are gonna be okay in the future. Um, you could include it as a finding if you're, you know, with approval based on these things, um, you could include a statement there that um, speaks to the width of the lot uh, versus the of those railings. And that could be used in any future COA request from another applicant, not just for this house, but for any house, when they say they wanna do this, this could be informative to this commission and future members of this commission as to if someone wants to use this example as a justification for something, that finding would speak specifically to what we would intended. Yes, that finding would be in the staff report um, I currently don't have the findings on the certificate of appropriateness sheet itself. Um, if that's something that the commission feels is important, I could definitely start adding those somewhere as well. Okay. Like I said, I'm just trying to find a bridge to all mm -hmm. the different comments that are being made. Thanks. Emily, tonight we're just giving feedback. Is that correct? The official COA will not be granted until next next meeting, November. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, does anyone else have further input, comments? Uh, sure, Shelly. Go ahead. Regarding, uh, TJ, regarding the the chimney caps, can you talk about why that selection was made? Why? So the, the selection was made for a uh, brick chimney with a cut stone cap that would lead up to just a, uh, a traditional clay pot. Um, again, just keeping the form simple, keeping it somewhat traditional in its nature, uh, not doing too much as far as the decorative elements up on that point there. Just trying to think if I've seen that treatment in other homes. Thank you. Anything further? I'm going to try to just give a synopsis of the things we've gone over. Um, there was comment made about the large proportionality of the windows, though we do acknowledge that the um, pain, uh, the panes were changed. Uh, the porch, quite a bit of discussion about uh, the perception of the inhabitability 
of the porch. And if changes can be made to indicate that that porch is not inhabitable on the basis of precedence going forward. Um, the corbel with the, uh, the large bracket, there was definitely some uh, uncomfortability there with both scope and weight and its asymmetry to the house. Um, chimney caps uh, were discussed, um, as were the columns and their scale. Did I miss anything? Okay. So the next uh, the next part of this process will be uh, the the formal admission of the certificate of appropriateness application for this construction, and that um, we're expecting to uh, tackle at our next meeting in November. Any last comments, questions on this? Uh, just one. This is uh, Chris Polad, the homeowner. I just want to thank everybody for their comments and their time tonight. Uh, we really feel like we've, uh, you know, designed a, a beautiful home and one that fits within the neighborhood that is uh, specific to the, you know, uh, specific to the, the unique lot that's there. And, you know, if, if I may on the, um, you know, just on one particular item, um, that kind of second floor, you know, whatever we're calling it, um, I, I know a lot of the discussion was just around the perception of the usability of it. Um, I just want to chime in and say we have, we have uh, young children and we uh, certainly don't want anybody to be out there and uh, there's not going to be any intent to use that. So I know that that wasn't necessarily the nature of this of the discussion, but I just wanted to mention that to the to the group. So thank you for your time tonight. Thank you for the comments. Thank you. We do appreciate all the uh, time and attention and work put into this project. Thank you. Okay, there are no further comments or questions regarding that property. We are going to move uh, to our third uh, report and recommendation section, which is um, a COA. Well, it is a request to determine that the house at 4600 Browndale Avenue uh, no longer contributes to the historical significance of the Country Club District. So Emily, I will let you present here. Um, thank you. Okay, the subject property of 4600 Browndale Avenue is on the west side of Browndale, the Mill Pond and south of Bridge Street. The home is a two-story Tudor revival style home that was built in 1927. And that 1927 date is according to the city's assessing records. Um, the Heritage Preservation Commission has reviewed projects associated with this address. Um, those include sketch plan submittals and a certificate of appropriateness request. A certificate of appropriateness um, for changes to the street facing facade was approved by the Heritage Preservation Commission back in February of this year. The current um, application to the Heritage Preservation Commission includes a request for the H to determine that the house at 4600 Browndale no longer contributes to the historical significance of the Country Club District and is therefore eligible to be torn down. The applicant states that the deterioration of the home, as well as some of its construction methodologies and siting challenges, have created difficulties in the continued use and maintenance of the structure. Um, the Country Club Plan of Treatment classifies houses built within um, 1924 to 1940 in the Country Club District as heritage preservation resources. Um, this is the period of time when the developer enforced rigid architectural standards on new home construction through restrictive covenants for the neighborhood. Um, the plan of street states that no certificate of appropriateness will be approved for the demolition of any heritage preservation resource in the district unless the applicant can show that the subject property is not a heritage preservation resource or no longer contributes to the historical significance of the district because its historic integrity has been compromised by deterioration, damage, or by inappropriate additions or alterations. Consultant Vogel has reviewed the application. Uh, his memo, his full memo was included in the packet tonight. 
um, he had stated that in his opinion, um, based on the information that was available in the house's present condition, um, the house at 4600 Browndale appears to retain sufficient historic integrity to be considered a contributing heritage preservation resource. Um, evaluated from the perspective of the district's historic context, the house dates from the district's period of significance. It shows the influence of the developer's master plan and is identifiable as a specimen of period revival style architecture. Um, it does not represent an individually significant architectural resource on its own. Um, the property retains historic integrity um, of the most important architectural character defining features that are associated with the Tudor revival style. Um, those being the steeply pitched roof, the facade dominated by a prominent street facing gable, half timbering um, chimneys and stucco wall cladding. Therefore, the of a COA for demolition would not be appropriate. The building official at the request of staff also visited the property and provided a memo with his findings. Um, and with that, um, staff's recommendation tonight uh, concurs with Consultant Vogel's evaluation of the proposed request at 4600 Browndale, denying the applicant's request and finding that demolishing the existing structure would not be appropriate and that 4600 Browndale Avenue is a contributing preservation resource in the Country Club District. And with that, um, I'll stand for any questions and also on the call tonight and they are hoping to present some information as well. Thank you, Emily. Um, commissioners, are there questions or concerns or would you like to have the homeowner present before we go through with that? I would recommend okay. hear from the applicant first and then we can kind of discuss uh, from there. Very good. Do I have the applicant on the line? Uh, yes. Uh, are you able to hear me? This is yes. Ryan Fish with Peterson Keller Architecture. Thank and, you. Uh, I believe the homeowners, homeowners Chris and Nico, are also with us, as well as uh, Gabriel Keller from Peterson Keller. Yep, we're also here. Okay. Uh, feel free to go ahead and present the information you've brought forward tonight. Are you uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, we okay. can see it. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Again, we appreciate the time to present in uh, the committee's time and purview on the request of removing this home from being considered a historical resource. Um, bear with me one second. Uh, Peterson Keller um, has worked on a, a large number of historical homes in the Twin Cities, and we enjoy the de design challenges that these uh, properties bring and uh, enjoy collaborating with the governing agencies that come up to come up with the viable and appropriate solutions. Uh, with all these projects, uh, we've never requested that a property be no longer considered a historical resource or have requested a teardown of historical property. So we do not take this request uh, lightly, and we, we understand the difficult consideration and, and decision uh, that this request uh, re creates. Um, Chris, and, Chris and Nico were um, drawn to the Country Club District area for, for its historical character and its a family-friendly family environment, and, and they want to raise their, their large family here um, in the area. So they were delighted to find uh, the, the property in question located right on the creek. Um, and they understood at the time that, you know, they would want need to renovate this historical home and it'd be a part of a, a solution through uh, processes uh, with the HPC. Uh, and they thought they could find a, a viable solution and were on board for it. <clears throat> All right, so, some of these images just again to show some additional images of the home. Um, you can see some surrounding ones, the existing plans. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, after spending a year into the process, and as Emily mentioned, multiple COA design reviews, uh, as well as multiple architects and, and several hundred thousand dollars in exploration and design costs, um, 
they and we have not been able to find a viable renovation solution uh, for their family or for the house to meet you know certain basic requirements that most modern families um, need and will need in the future. Um, as you can see from the uh, timeline, um, they aren't alone in, in trying to uh, renovate the home. The, the previous owner also had multiple designers um, look at the, um, the home in question to see if they could renovate for their families. And um, according to what, it, from the records, it appears that um, the previous owner and then the owner before that um, hadn't reside in the house for quite a few years, almost up to 10 years. Um, I think, uh, you know, the intricacies of the historical renovation, the home's clay tile wall construction, and what that means for a, a structural solution for renovations um, isn't easily ascertained from, you know, typical homeowners due diligence in buying a home or, or um, in considering that they take on a project and knowing they have to work with the, to the, the HPC. So um, I, I can understand why the, there's been multiple attempts yet hasn't been successful because it is a very uh, intricate and nuanced um, home with the various difficulties. <clears throat> As um, Emily mentioned, uh, we think there are multiple reasons why the, the house is um, essentially is losing um, its resource quality and in that it is unable to be renovated for um, a modern family. And part of that uh, comes in siting uh, and building construction uh, as far as the, the clay tiles are involved. And so, as you can see here, uh, the, the driveway is one of the major siting issues. Uh, it narrows down between uh, the actual house um, and the neighbor's privacy fence down to about seven foot six. Um, that kind of average larger family car that would hold the family, um, I believe it's seven, might be eight. We did, they just had a recent one. Um, they we are within inches of that clearance. Um, compounding on that uh, feature, uh, is that the driveway also turns and uh, either you're going downhill or uphill at a steep inclines. So you, you literally have to um, go at a very, very slow speed um, to kind of without digging up your car. And then on either side of this narrow enclosure is the main sidewalk from the front door um, ends at the driveway. And then on the back side, which you don't see in this photos is uh, one of the main circulation stairs um, out of the home. It literally dumps out onto the driveway, uh, as you can see in this left photo, kind of where the back uh, tire of the car is. That is the last step of the stairs that uh, enters the home. And so having uh, multiple small children, um, you know, it, it, it's concerning that you have little, literally no sight lines to either side of the main circula circulation paths on the exterior of the home as well as the idea that yes, a, a car can go through here, but it, it, you know, going past this four to eight times a day and having to inch past it so that you don't scratch your car um, or endanger children is, is, um, is a hard, is a hard uh, virtually impossible to without doing something to the exterior of the home. And again, this is a front facing facade so if it were to be edited we are now getting into you know uh affecting the front side of the home um, some of the other um i think i passed it some of the other site issues is that um this is one of two driveways um that are along the creek i'll, I'll preface this that are along the creek that uh, lead to a rear facing uh driveway and and so uh, it takes a uh, you know, a substantial amount and hard surface in the rear of the lot to create the turnaround and rear facing driveway. So it is a unique uh, situation. I understand there are drivers that go past the home to some of the detached garages, but uh, it's one of only two homes along the creek in this district um, that has this, this situation. As well as you can see from this photo, the, the home is kinked 
as it tries to align with the two adjacent homes. Um, it actually doesn't align with the, um, the property to the, the right. Um, and the kink itself uh, creates all kinds of um, issues in an already narrowly um, spaced home inside. And it creates issues with uh, structural in nature that I'll talk about in, here in a moment when we have to kind of inlay a secondary structural system into the, into the house. Um, <clears throat> the second uh, kind of major region, uh, reason is the, the construction of the home itself. The exterior walls is a load-bearing clay tile. The stucco on the outside and the plaster on the inside are inherent to the clay brick. Uh, so um, neither finish would be able to be easily removed without some of the, the tile crumbling. As well, there is no insulation uh, within within this walls. Um, so kind of prevail, prevailing building science today, is, as you can see in, in Minnesota uh, energy codes, is that pushing the insulation to the exterior of the wall is what is needed in um, this region to properly insulate a home. Obviously, we can't we can't do that in this home because it would pretty much obliterate the the historical significance of the facade. Um, we're even unable to insulate inside the walls, as probably uh, I mean I'm guesstimating that probably 95% of the other homes within the district uh, are are wood framing, and you can open up the wall and insulate. Um, so you're unable to insulate the wall itself. Uh, you're unable to run electrical or plumbing within the exterior walls at all. So everything has to be brought inside the home. Now, yes, you you can you know you can run electrical and plumbing and fur in the wall, but again, the the home is uh, uninsulated. So uh, you know we really kind of looked for what is the solution to insulate a home where um, the the clients are you know spending you know millions on renovating this home. Is it really fair to have them have an uninsulated home, especially as our energy needs go up and our energy requirements as far as the building code um, go up. The only way to really do this in a building science way is to is to fur in the wall and then use some type of insulation that wouldn't be affected um, by moisture. So like a spray foam or that type of thing. However, that does conceal the existing um, exterior wall, so you're unable to notice if moisture is um, penetrating the walls and um, moisture can be trapped, easily trapped in the wall, and it's unable to dry in both directions as it was originally designed in the 20s. This type of wall dries from both directions, depending on the temperature. And if we were to insulate to the inside, this no longer happens. So now moisture is going to be trapped in the walls. And we supplied, um, both uh, letters from a structural engineer and a building science expert um, uh, kind of describing their concerns about how this would just um, quickly or hasten the deterioration of both existing walls and any kind of structure that we we put into the renovation of the homes will now be, uh, be deteriorating because of this trapped uh, moisture. <clears throat> Here, here's some of the letters, and we've uh, just kind of highlighted their concerns as far as uh, the moisture trapping um, and the structural concerns of essentially um, all the walls, the uh, and structure are kind of embedded in the clay tile. And the nature of this clay tile, historic clay tile, is that there's a very good chance that once you start, uh, say, opening up the wall to provide a new header above a window, that this clay tile will crumble. So um, structural engineers have generally recommended that you insert the structure with inside of that wall. So it's almost a separate structural system. Again, th this with the furred in wall is for insulation is all eating away at already kind of historically narrow spaces. Uh, as you can hear, here's an example of one corner of the house. And so as we ins um, fur in the walls for both insulation sh and structural, we now virtually have to touch almost uh, every space in the house. And it makes some of the existing spaces as bathrooms and showers and stairs um, not meet code 
even more, or it just uh, it essentially allows the use of say that shower is no is now two feet wide. And so, um, yes, you know, can there be solutions uh, found for some of these individual challenges? But kind of as a whole, as you put them together, there is virtually been impossible to find a, a solution that. Um, answers all these questions as well as keeps the existing homes structural integrity. <clears throat> so um, we, we kind of just uh, looked at uh, the home and the, and the multiple sellers and as the district, generally their home prices have been increasing because it, again, it's a highly sought after area. This home has been uh, decreasing in value as uh, it has been sold uh, repeatedly, has been attempted to uh, be rented out, um, and um, has, you know, again, attempted to renovate and make new this project, but uh, has not been able to buy, find a, a viable uh, solution. Um, and again, it is from the previous owner that they sold it to the YROVEX and then the previous owner before there, we have um, kind of cobbled together information that essentially this house for various reasons has been uh, unoccupied for approximately uh, 10 years. Uh, as well, the house is uninsulated. And since it's been unoccupied, you know, uh, unintentionally, you know, the house is probably being kept um, conditioned at a minimal level and uh, maintenance has been, again, over multiple owners, has been kept at a minimal level because it's been unoccupied. So this has only hastened the kind of deterioration uh, of, of the home. Um, in the 1960s, uh, in a, an addition was uh, put on the, the house to the back. It was a, a contemporary style addition that um, I think is deemed as not contributing uh, to the district. You can see it from the street. Uh, we, we would also argue that, you know, the creek is uh, is still is also a strong uh, visible and recreation corridor. So as many of the other homes are essentially two, two front facades in this area, this this home's uh, kind of river or creek facade has already been um, has been damaged in its historical qualities with the contemporary addition, which you can also see uh, from the street. And it, it is probably not as evident from, as you know, in our review of, of some of the, 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 as they would call them, windshield reviews of the, the homes in the neighborhood. It, this is not quite evident um, from, from the street, but you can see that. Um, and so, um, I, I mean, we, we don't degree, disagree that this is a historic resource. Um, I, I would say this isn't a, an exemplary um, example of a tutor in the neighborhood. Um, and, you know, if the home was allowed to be demolished, the homeowners are committed to collaborating with the HPC in designing a new traditional tutor home that they, you know, the, the goal would be that it would be a contributing member to the historic fabric uh, of the neighborhood for centuries to come. And as I can see today, this was my first experience with Dinah's HPC, that it has a, an excellent and well-established processes to ensure that the new home's design would be fitting within the neighborhood and be uh, contributing. Um, and um, you can see, we, we kind of pointed out that the minimal amount of uh, details, there is uh, a small amount of timbering uh, right above the front entry. There's a small amount of, of stonework uh, on the chimney and uh, to the right of where the driveway goes past. Again, uh, I mean, yes, it is a, you know, it is a contributing historical resource, but a, not an exemplary uh, one. And then as we looked at precedents, uh, we did, you know, there was one home uh, in recent, which was allowed to be demol demolished due to structural and environmental circumstances. And in our review of some of the other approved um, eight, uh, COA approvals of front facade um, renovations, as you can see on the screen here, 
I would think that uh, the new home that we would propose would have, um, you know, it would not be any more drastic of change as some of these that you you see on the screen here is from what was the historic fabric to what is still a wonderful, the ones on the right are still wonderful contributing uh, homes. Um, they just are, you know, slightly different in appearance and even in some cases uh, a style. But again, the homeowner is committed to um, replacing the home with another uh, historically detailed Tudor home. Uh, in summary, as we have said, you know, this is an incredibly difficult situation and decision. You know, the decision boils down to if we want to recognize and acknowledge the unique challenges of this property, and if we allow it to be developed in a way that will ultimately be positive for both the current homeowners and the community and, and, and future homeowners, or if we want, you know, shy away from these difficulties and allow the property to remain vacant and most likely uh, continue to be passed from new homeowner to new homeowner until they realize the difficulties uh, of the project and then again, pass it on. So uh, we thank you for your time and we appreciate and recognize the need for this healthy debate. And we acknowledge the validity of the multiple perspectives that have been sent into the, the city in your committee on this important request. Thank you. Thank you very much for the information and the explanation. With that, um, commissioners, do you have questions, comments? I have a question. Uh, Ryan, can, you, sure. can you speak a little bit more as to why you didn't uh, explore exterior insulation in this? Uh, for this application, it feels like that would be a good solution. And um, yes, it would be something that we would have to look at as a as a commission because it would be, you know, taking off all the stucco and adding a layer of insulation. But mm -hmm. it feels like that could be an appropriate approach to remodeling this house given the context and constraints that you have. Um, thank, thanks for the question. I, I mean, we. We had some uh, um, kind of initial discussions with Emily, and uh, and then as well as our interpretation of the the new home um, design guide um, by the HPC that you know uncovering the original facade, which would be pretty much 100% in its entirety, would mean that um, that it would be considered a new home, and to be considered a new home, the old home would have to be uh, deemed as you know, not a historical resource uh, anymore, because essentially we would be adding, you know, two to three inches uh, of thickness, probably you know, three inches of thickness or more to the, the whole facade, recreating stucco. The windows would either have to be, you know, moved out to um, a, those falling inches or the look of those windows would now become, you know, they would be set way back from the, the facade and would have a, a completely different look. Um, so it was- But you could maintain the the form and the clay brick and and all of that. And, and maybe Emily, you've had this conversation with Ryan, it sounds like, but it, I just, um, we just kind of, kind of sped right through that, that that, that is probably, yep. if this wasn't in the district, that would be yes. a great approach to solving this problem. Yes, that would be a great, yes. If it wasn't in this district, that would be the recommended approach since we can't, uh, it is, you know, recommended uh, approach for, you will see this continue in our, in our energy codes. That is the recommended approach and that prevents moisture. And yes, that would be uh, a great solution, but didn't see it as viable with it being a um, historical resource. Did that, did that answer your question or? Uh, yes, yeah. and maybe we can have Emily speak to that a little more. I mean, would that be something that could be explored? You know, maybe maybe there's a sweet spot of maybe it's inch and a half, two inches, and then there's some <laughs> interior elevation. I mean, really, you just want to keep that wall warm-ish and prevent uh, kind of any sort of moisture getting in. So, you know, if they were to add two inches across the whole facade, the mm -hmm. whole house, uh, yes, it would, you know, overall increase the volume of the house by four inches, two inches on each side. But if if the form were to stay the same, 
on the front street facing facade. Is that something that uh, I guess I guess what are what's kind of our stance on that? What's the city's stance on that? Uh, maybe Robert can speak to it from a historic standpoint on a historic home, but um, as interpreting the plan of treatment, um, if the exterior walls remain, you know, there are some additions that walls that were at one point exterior walls become interior walls. Those walls are not counted towards demolished walls or walls that aren't included, or they would still be included in the square footage of the wall that's kept. Um, so I, I, it would definitely re require um, review by the Heritage Preservation Commission um, because it would be considered a change to the street facing facade, in my opinion. Um, I don't know if Robert, you wanna speak to a little bit for that, how that would be um, considered with a historic standpoint. Well, what you're talking about is a treatment that isn't really common, but does occur in other historic districts, especially commercial districts, uh, where the issue of dealing with solid brick masonry and or even brick and tile masonry walls is is, uh, is common. Uh, uh, it's never come up in the context of the Diana Country Club district. Um, but in my opinion, uh, the Secretary of the Interior's standards for rehabilitation would allow that approach of insulating on the exterior and essentially just sort of inflating the house, I guess, and, and uh, retaining its character defining features or even restoring its character defining features. Uh, so, yes, in a theoretical kind of way, uh, it would be considered appropriate, I think. Uh, I, I mean, I, um, I was kind of interjecting that. I mean, we would have to recreate because the facade in every direction would be out, uh, you know, let's just say three inches for argument's sake, we would have to recreate every uh, trim piece. Um, you know, there are brick lintels. I, I'm not how inherent they are to the the clay tile, but all of that um, would need to be adjusted out or recreated. So um, it would be a uh, a solution uh, to the to the exterior insulation. And as I I guess I maybe I wasn't clear before. I mean, I, and these are the kind of things where we pick one item of it and we say, okay, can we can we solve this? That would be a good solution for item. Would it mean we're essentially recreating the exterior um, in a, as, as Robert said, an inflated uh, kind of look, I suppose? Um, that would, you know, that would solve, uh, that would help solve the insulation issues. We would still most likely have to, you know, fur in the walls anyways uh, to, you know, get electrical outlets and, um, there is there's some really very real concern about incorporating new structure, so new window lintels, new beams to you know hold up the floors. You know they would have to be independent of the the of the clay tile walls, and then be brought. So if there's a change in the third floor, that structure would have to be brought all the way down to the to the foundation in the basement, as it the structural engineers can really not rely. Uh, on the current clay tile system. So for us, the hardest part was this taking all these elements so we can find a solution for one of them, but finding solutions for, for all of them and still you know, you know, keeping this home uh, historical nature and not outpacing the, uh, the, the, the cost of the home by threefold of any other house in the neighborhood just because of the all the difficulties with the the current um, construction methods of this home or the existing construction methods methods of this home. There may also be some zoning implications there if the there is currently some non-conforming setbacks. So yes. um, it yeah. would likely require a variance through the planning commission for those non-conforming setbacks. Thank you. Anyone else have questions, comments? Go ahead, Commissioner Lundquist. I'd like to start with a question, uh, Emily. In addition 
to the better together comments, the 13 opposing this, could the applicants, were they able to see the 25 opposing comments and the details that came along into the commission, were those visible to the applicants? Um, I shared those with the applicant um, with, through Friday. I believe okay. that I have the emails through a certain point. Um, I didn't share any of the emails past Friday. They are uh, available to the applicant. I can definitely share those if they're interested in seeing. Um, but yes, the majority of them are through that certain point when I sent them the email were shared. I, I believe I believe we received twelve of them. So, okay, well, maybe and then all of them, all the um, posts on Better Together, of course, were visible. Mm -hmm. yes, um, yes, yep. And there's twenty five that, by my count. In any case, I think I would like to just step back and center the discussion. You know, as always with difficult conversations, we have to anchor it on the plan of treatment. And I actually wanted to dive in just for the record into one line in Consultant Vogel's memo. Um, which was explaining that ordinarily the HPC only issues a COA for the demolition if there's approved plans in place. I just want to tease out, especially for new members, that really applies the way it's written to conversations like we just had about Edgebrook. There's also language, and this is, of course, the one that we're looking at, that you cannot have a COA for the demolition and in whole or part of a historic contributing resource, and that's the conversation here. Um, his comment that ordinarily is true, but it's, I just want to say the language, the way it's written applies to those that are outside of the zone of 24 to 44. And I think it's important for new members to know there has been only one historic contributing home since this current plan of treatment was put in place in 2008. And that was the 4505 Arden. That was a very contentious issue and was first submitted as a renovation and, and so on and went forward. So um, as it's written, based on all the evidence submitted, we can't, in fact, the architect himself just said, I don't disagree, it's a historic resource. The issue is it's a resource that's problematic for adding the addition and renovations that they want. The plan of treatment doesn't touch that. So on a very purist form, um, you know, I think we have to frame it that way. Um, I do appreciate comments like Sarah's, let's look to be creative. And I think in the first of the several sketch plan reviews, um, you know, the commission, we are open to working with, there are tricky lots and quirks and, and all of those old home wonderful things. And our is very willing to work with those, um, you know, and the clay tile is not unique and, and likely not a surprise in the vintage of homes that, that we're dealing with. The other, um, staff comment that I just wanted to call a little attention to again, just for the record, my thoughts, the chief building official, um, his memo did call into question sort of shelf life of older homes. And that is one perspective. I will share that many residents in the neighborhood have had a frustration that there's a perception or bias in the building department uh, towards new construction and not such the preservation mindset. I think that preservation mindset came through loud and clear in the neighborhood comments um and the chief building official said i agree with the architect's report well, we know because of the extensive comments you know that many things especially on the timeline and the proposed degrading of value that uses a listing price instead of a market value so i, I don't think we need to go through point by point but i just wanted to flag that bias and i wanted to anchor us back to the plan of treatment um, as I as we hear from the other commissioners. Commissioner Lundquist, thank you for that. It was beautifully stated. Do you, do you mind if I make a, a comment to uh, Commissioner Lundquist? Go ahead. Uh, I, there, there, as she mentioned, there are there are just uh, as per what I've reviewed by the guide, there are there are two two factors in determining whether um, you know that this house is was or is a historical resource and we're not denying that it, it uh, was a historical resource it's the second part of that that is you know and when, so when i said is it a historical resource yes we're not denying it we're not denying it, it was like a faulty report that it just got put in as a historical resource but we're we are what we're asking for is that it is no longer 
a historical resource for these reasons. <clears throat> Thank you for the comment and that's noted. Um, do I have any other commissioner? Go ahead, Commissioner Birdman. Yes, so a couple comments. One, I, I wanna be very clear that the, the example that uh, Commissioner Lundquist provided as the other uh, resource that was ultimately torn down that was in a protected class, the 405 Arden, 4505 Arden, I was on the board when that happened, um, and what specifically happened with that was the this group had approved a COA for renovation, so on and so forth. But then once they got in to actually start working on the project, they then discovered through the building process so many things that were not discoverable at that time that then caused it to no longer be viable to where the building department would no longer actually provide the permits um, and approval for that. Um, so we did follow the process and go from that standpoint. That brings me to this thing before us. The, the immediate thing that I asked Emily from the second we got correspondence related to this was, how are we to validate and verify the actual condition of this home as to whether or not um, it presents a danger to someone? Uh, what's the extent that, that it is in, in disrepair or whatever it might be and so on and so forth? The real issue for this group, in my opinion, is based on whatever that condition is, what level of renovation is appropriate that we would feel comfortable with in doing and that the building department would actually deem as safe and appropriate for a family to live in. That's the things we have to balance. The, the, the degree to which this applicant wants to renovate this particular property, as Jane has just pointed out, is secondary, if not tertiary, to that question. So when I when I read this about the clay uh, tiles and the insulation and so on, so on, whatever it might be, in order for it to be renovated, in order for it to be able to be up to code and be able to provide the requirements that any residential building is now in Edina, what would then be required in order to do that? Um, if they want to add on three different extensions to the back of the house and that, that's not typically a part of our purview. They can't do that because the structure doesn't allow them to do that, but it would be allowed to be renovated to the point to where it wouldn't have to be torn down. Then it then becomes a question as, is it, a, is it something that this group is going to authorize for a uh, renovation of a certain type? Or if the homeowner doesn't want to do that or is not, uh, you know, it's not to their liking to be able to do that. Well, then it becomes an issue of, well, is then this the property that is right for them versus not? Um, the the correspondence that we received from the community at large was this is no question a historical um, asset to the community as long as it can be somewhat rehabilitated. And what I just heard from Robert was if it can be re rehabilitated through different means and whatever it is up to a certain level, then it's something that should be saved. If it can't be renovated under any circumstance, well, then that's a whole different question. Going back to 4505 Arden, that ended up being what it was. It wasn't a question anymore, of could we, couldn't we? It was, no, you no longer could, become a building safety standpoint. I don't know if we're in that category in this particular situation, but for my purposes, that's the question I'd like answered before I'd consider ever taking something off as a uh, heritage preservation um, asset to the district. Thank you. Commissioner Bergman, I think your experience with the 4505 Arden um, scenario is extraordinarily valuable since that was the only one that actually came to my mind as well. Um, uh, and I, I I will state that I completely agree with you on the viability of a renovation, not a particular kind of renovation. Um, and that is that is that as well as Commissioner Lundquist anchoring it in the plan of treatment and the the very basic language that we need to focus on. That's what's before us. Um, I can speak a little bit too on the history of the 4505 Arden project. Um, that project did come in front of the HPC or HPB at the time um, with a similar request to remove a historic um, resource classification on the home and that request was denied at that point in time. Um, and then they had 
come through and gotten a certificate of appropriateness and through the construction is when um, they had an engineer sign off that the structure, the I believe it was the foundation, um, was faulty or had it wasn't able to be um, added onto at that point it needed to come down. Emily, thank you for the clarification. Commissioners, do I have any other comments, questions? Yeah, I have a question. Just, you know, on the two points that are in the submittal about, uh, you know, the front walk and the driveway, um, it's my understanding that the front walk um, can be relocated at any time uh, without our approval. Uh, but with, uh, you know, a building permit of some sort from the city. Um, with respect to the driveway itself, I understand it's it's very narrow, uh, which was not a surprise uh, to, to these homeowners when they purchased it. Um, and I'm curious to know if the homeowners have had a conversation with their neighbors uh, regarding that retaining wall, whether it's possible to obtain an easement, uh, in order to widen that uh, driveway so that they, uh, you know, it's not quite as narrow. Uh, this is Chris Wyrovic. Um We have not had uh, that specific conversation with them, uh, uh, but it it is a quite a narrow uh, side yard that they have. Um, I mean, uh, we could, we will ask and, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised that they uh, don't want to give up any of their side yard for us to expand our dri uh, the, the driveway. Um, and just for clarification, we have seven children, uh, Sorry. Sorry. adults, um, and uh, and we, we were looking for uh, uh, this house uh, to be, uh, to be the place that we could, uh, uh, renovate um, to be able to live there with our with our families. It's been over a year where we have uh, been trying to figure out how to make uh, this house uh, livable um, uh, and uh, and and be able to uh, have that uh, be livable for for all nine of us. Um, and of course, sooner or later, kids uh, go off to college and and then they don't come back as, as often. Uh, but um, you know that's not going to have in, happen anytime soon. We're well, certainly with our three-month-old and four-year-old and six-year-old and eight-year-old. Um, so uh, we we uh, we have been uh, 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 you know spending quite a bit of money on on experts, uh, uh, good experts in in in, reno in in renovating older homes, and uh, it it is not the easy uh, easy solution that we came up with uh, to kind of say, hey, we need to uh, kind of start over. Uh, we're willing to uh, uh, put back something that is uh, it, it, that is. We were not looking for an eyesore. We don't want to be uh, basically hated by the uh, by the community. We want to we want to fit into the community. Um, it is it is important to us. Uh, that's why we chose this community. Uh, uh, however, this house uh, has got. I mean, issues. It's uh, it's been empty for ten years for for a reason uh, that we thought it was a uh, it was more of an opportunity uh, than the um, than the than the than the frustration that we've had with trying to find a solution uh, to to modernize the house somewhat or make it more livable for a modern family, uh, but still have the uh, wonderful uh, uh, historical uh, nature of the of the house and and uh, history behind it. Um, so this is uh, for for the people that that are uh, st still on this committee uh, that uh, that uh, were present when we got the COA. We do appreciate the COA uh, that we did receive. But the, as we got into that and uh, we started opening up walls and realized what was sitting on top of one another and and the, and the clay tiles is an issue, not just for the insulation that I've heard you uh, you, you you mentioned quite a bit, um, but also uh, I think. Um, uh, 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 Ryan made uh, made a comment that if we change something on third floor, uh, we have to bring that structure uh, all the way down to the uh, to, to the cellar to the basement um, uh, as a uh, to, to hold to hold things up and and um, you know that creates uh, once you once you open up those walls and open up those uh, those those items and and we and we we do mention that often is is you know you can kind of solve uh, one of the issues or maybe even a couple but as far as uh, it doesn't make that doesn't make the house livable by just slapping 
two, three, four inches of insulation on the outside. Uh, I mean, the inside, the the, the wiring, the plumbing, the uh, the, the 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 trap the the traps for the bathtubs uh, the, the, everything is is very outdated, um, and some of it is is not the, it's not the code. I'm I'm not the expert in that, uh, but that is why uh, this has taken as long as it has to get to this point, and it has been over a year, um, and and we've been um, we, we've you know we haven't been happy with the money we've been spending, but we're willing to spend the money on on the professionals to tell us that this house is. Is is not uh, rehabable. Um, so now we bring it to you guys, uh, and of course, there's rules uh, that we respect uh, the rules and we follow the rules to see if there's a way uh, to, if there's a way forward um, um, to find a happy medium somewhere here where we can uh, we can uh, get a home that um, um, you know that may not be uh, the, the historic nature uh, uh, on uh, anymore that uh, that 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 once was. Um, and um, but uh, what we what we do want, even even if that's the case, if we take it off the historic register, we still want to build build something that is of, of equal um, uh, 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 that fits into the neighborhood. Uh, it makes it look like it's been there forever um, instead of something. Ah, that's a brand new home. We aren't looking for that. We would have we would have found someplace else to uh, to uh, to buy a home if if we wanted something uh, super modern. So we do appreciate the time, the effort uh, that that all of you are are giving to this, um, and uh, and we are we are we appreciate um, the comments uh, that give us a glimmer of hope that there's a possibility for a path forward, not knowing what that is at the present time, but uh, we want to find that we just don't have the um, you know years uh, to kind of figure that out before we build a home for 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 the family to get into. So we would like to. We'd, we'd like to um, figure that out and and uh, and and get on that path uh, to to finding uh, finding the right solutions, and then uh, building the home that everybody will um, uh, will love in that neighborhood. It so sounds like by the previous site, you know, I know that it was it's, it's a it's a different situation with that house that's being uh, uh, demolished uh, because it didn't fit into this uh, this time frame of when it was built. Um, but uh, uh, it seems to be a a, a solid solution that. You guys are at least open to um, uh, uh, the, the listening to to what what specifically uh, in numbers we have that's wrong with this house, uh, and I'm not sure exactly what sort of um, uh, information and, and certifications uh, or, or letters or or uh, or uh, structural engineers reports uh, that you are looking for, uh, but we're willing to get them and supply them. Um, if if the if that'll help um, make make the right decision here to to make this house livable again, I mean having a, a, a house in in this neighborhood empty for ten years, I mean that's that's unfortunate that's unfortunate in itself. Um, so we're still looking for a viable solution here. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much for those comments, and I will say that um, I I was on the commission when we looked at your multiple sketch plans and granted the COA. So I do, I do note that you are uh, invested in the neighborhood and um, trying to do the right thing. With that, commissioners, do we have hmm. any more question or comment? Go ahead, Commissioner Lundquist. I, I do just want to note that the extensive community comments um, rebutted that claim that it's been empty for 10 years. And one of the paths forward, I thought for me, the most compelling correspondence was that for the family that owned it from, it was a 2017 to 2019 or the most recent sale. And they had renovation plans that they actually submitted along with their correspondence. They had a structural engineer look at it. And those plans may be the best path forward. Um, I just want to be clear that I hope the applicants aren't um, interpreting my comment or our comments as to say, uh, yes, you can prove it's un, un, unworthy of renovating and rebuild something in the exactly the same style. The plan of treatment doesn't say that and community comments don't either. That's not to say that there's not some middle ground and we certainly hope that you can find a renovation. Um, that will work for the home. Um, it's tricky, that's for sure, but renovating the old homes, in my opinion, is worth it. Thank you, Commissioner Lundquist. Emily, can we also make note that uh, Commissioner Everson has joined the meeting as well? 
Yes, I did. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Okay, more conversation, questions? Go ahead, Commissioner Birdman. Well, I'd just like to ask the group, I mean, what what would we require to validate or invalidate the actual condition of the home that would e would easily be able to answer the question of whether or not it's plausible to renovate or not? To me, that the, the, the applicant is basically saying it's not. It's not capable of renovation in any reasonable or appropriate or safe way of doing it or whatever it might be. And their argument is, I wish to, you know, the, the idea of taking it as it's not historically significant, if I may put it into context that I think it sounds like, is that they're saying in its current condition, it's not, it, it, we need to have it no longer be listed as significant, so then there's other options that are then available. To me, the question is at hand as to, is it in that far of disrepair in order for that to be a valid request and question? And what, if any evidence would be required by this group to be presented that would tell us yes or no? Because today I would think, not only from the community comment, but from what I've heard already, I know that we've heard from everybody else, but like we haven't seen enough yet that would even allow us to entertain that question. My question stemming from that, Commissioner Birdman, is, is the applicant saying that this home is not renovatable or is the applicant saying this home is not renovatable to their wishes? That, And I think that there's an important distinction. Um, as Commissioner Lundquist pointed out, the former owner did have plans for renovation and did graciously submit those. Um, but I, I, I've Take in the away. conversation and the and the arguments that we've heard from both Mr. Fish and the homeowner, the term modern family, okay. modern family needs um, is continually brought up. So I wonder if the issue is that this home is not able to be renovated to, to suit those modern family needs that they're looking for. And I think that that's the, that's the distinguishing line that we need to address, or as Commissioner Lundquist said, that's maybe not even what we need to address. What we need to address is the plan of treatment and how that's written. And does this request as it's presented before us adhere to the plan of treatment. Well, what I, was, what I was trying to say about the 4505 is that when it was first presented to us, the plan of treatment allowed us to provide the COA for 4505 Arden. Then once they got into it, it then became clear, even though the COA and the renovation that was undone, it was then no longer viable, not from a COA standpoint, from an actual building and safety standpoint to do that. What I'm, what I'm, I'm, I'm not saying deviate from the plan of treatment at all. What I'm saying is, is that I can go to the plan of treatment and discuss whether this is appropriate or not to do something. But to me, what I, again, I'd love clarification from either the applicant or other people on the commission. Are we at that question as to is it or is it not renovatable in its current condition to any renovation? Or is it to you what you just said, Chair Schilling, or is it just not to their desires of what they wish to have this property do for them? Because to me, that would answer it for me right there and then. If the if the answer, I'll just I'll just show my hand. If you tell me that nope, it's still renovatable, that yes, it's extensive, it wouldn't be, you know, it's not super practical, but it is uh, you know appropriate and whatever you could do something with it, but it won't get to the scale or to the elements that the particular applicant wants at this moment. The argument that the applicant would then be making, which I think is what everybody in their community comment was reacting to, was you want to tear down this house because it's no longer renovatable to your what you want it to be, not not it can't be renovated at all. Uh, and I think may it's a very may I make a comment to that? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate all the insight, Commissioner Berman. I, I guess my my question or insight I would like to if if the HPC committee could provide is is exactly what you were asking is I, I mean I believe 
you know, there are some simple uh, basic uh, items that this house in re renovating in, in any fashion uh, is not able to do in a recommended um, in a recommended path by building science experts or uh, structural engineers and that it is inherently to do with the, the clay tile walls which is unusual I think even uh, Robert mentioned is unusual for this district and is that you know you know would anybody think that you know having a let's just say four million dollar house that's uninsulated uh is not able to have uh plumbing or electrical conduit uh, run through the exterior walls um is and if it is insulated is set up to you know future deterioration and potential mold problems and that and that type of thing and so uh, i i agree is what do we need to show you that <clears throat> would pro provide us a path. I mean, right now there isn't, you know, it's a, it's a gray area, right? It's like, where's the path? We are unsure where that path is. And, and you know, it would be unfortunate if we would have to take it, uh, you know, much further along and, and say, let's, okay, let's open up the clay tile because the stuck, the plaster is inherent to the clay tile. And the, the uh, structural engineer has already said, you know, you try to create a pocket in there and the clay tile crumbles. It's, it's already too late. Like you've done the damage, right? So how how do we um, present documentation to this committee or to the city uh, that would show that that's not achievable by uh, either you know building science or uh, you know building code? What what proof is is needed to find a path in that direction? Sure, Shelley. Go ahead. Uh, I would ask, could you go live in this house today? No. You couldn't? No. Not in its current state, I, I don't believe. No. Following up on that, Matt, we have a memo from the, the building official from the city who notes, yes, there are a number of issues that, you know, perhaps aren't up to code. But there are not existing homes that are like that. Um, you know, it, obviously there's some interior remodeling that's happened and hasn't been completed. But uh, is this home habitable? Is it structurally sound right now? It, yes, it's it's structurally sound right now. There is no insulation to the building. And when I say it's not habitable right now, there is no kitchen in the house currently um, um, and some other areas that I'm not 100% sure what, what homeowner, you know, in, in researching uh, what this house is, how it's built and everything, there's been areas of demolition to find, to research this house inside. And so in its current state, when I say it's not livable, it's because there is no kitchen. Um, yes, it's structurally sound, but there is no uh, insulation to the, to the home. So I think the point I was trying to make was that this house doesn't need to be taken down. I live in a house about 200 feet away from this home. I drive by this house four times a day. I walk by it twice a day. And my house looks exactly like this house, has the same issues. I got weird wires running every which way. I got the same little crumble here and there. But I, I don't see anything that would make me think that it couldn't be saved. And I would reference the two homes directly south of this as great examples of how we can work together collaboratively and maintain the presence of the home and the scale and the property in the neighborhood to that remedy. I, I just, I, I can't see any way to, to think this should be demolished. And I'm also think, oh, go ahead. Ryan, like how did it get to, from an, an approved COA to no longer, you know, livable? I'm, I'm just wondering what the process was there. Why, why was it all of a sudden we are approving this COA and now it's being, it, it's, it, you want it demolished. Uh, were there discoveries other than elements that the structure could potentially, you know, be crumbling or I, I guess I'm, I'm not sure where you, how you got to this point. Uh, I mean, we were, as our firm was not uh, part of the previous uh, COA, uh, that was with with a, a different architect. So 
um, I may defer some of that to uh, Chris or, or Nico in, in that, but I, I believe in the attempts of when they got to COA and in the summer of the kind of discovery of, okay, we're gonna start looking at um, uh, taking, because it was approved COA with some certain conditions and, and the rest of the drawings still needed to be developed. And as they needed to do some discovery to continue with the drawings, again, this, this was in our drawings, I believe it was discovered on um, you know the, the multiple issues uh, with with the clay tile and uh, getting the structural design of that it's was essentially uh, a whole secondary structural system with that they were not going to use the the clay tile as the structural system which it is now um, that it, it became unviable. Um, but I would I defer to Chris and Nico since we weren't a part of that. Uh, yes, I mean, I mean yeah, this is Chris Wyrovic again. Um, one of the uh, the the first uh, the first architect well, what happened was we realized uh, that uh, you can only do so much architecturally on trying to do this that and the other thing. Uh, sooner or later, you have to uh, get a builder involved that uh, that is uh, that knows what they're doing and is, has done renovations as successfully. And uh, and that's what we did last uh, last year, uh, or early this year. Um, and uh, and as as we got into the building, um, um, uh, and, and and the ish building issues of actually renovating and and uh, opening up a wall or or taking down some walls or what do we do with the stucco on the outside that's uh, that's actually adhered to those clay tiles and what do we do with the stucco on the inside that's actually adhered to those clay tiles on the inside um, and, uh, and to be able to uh, just open up uh, um, uh, to make it more livable. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an older home, so it's got a lot of small rooms. It's got a lot of you know, uh, dead ends. It's got uh, you know, two bedrooms that are, that are connected by a closet you gotta walk through instead of uh, you know, having a separate uh, a, a door uh, to get to it. Uh, it's, uh, it's just been, um, uh, you know, we 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 had high hopes uh, for it to be uh, buildable, but uh, the more the um, um, and and what we found out with the, with the builder and and the uh, the the uh, uh, the structural engineers uh, that uh, that you, you know have, we've sent some letters. Maybe the letters need to be uh, made stronger. Is that it's it's just not possible to change any of this house um, uh, and um, uh, and update it. Uh, you, you put uh, put good wiring in it, put good plumbing in it, put, put, and and do the things uh, that that uh, need to be done for this home. Um, uh, and and it's 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 not it's not the first choice we had of saying, hey, we need to uh, d demolish this house by any means. So that's not uh, that's not our choice. But it is it is it is we have. We have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on architectures and, 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 and engineers and, and b being able to come to this, uh, to this conclusion of uh, that this house is, is tired. And the previous owners, um, not exactly sure what they did, uh, uh, but uh, you know, they, they certainly did work on, on uh, uh, getting a, a, a solution uh, that uh, also was not livable for them. Um, so they they uh, they they did a little bit of renovation downstairs in the basement. It's like I don't know if they saw the clay tiles, realized that it was a it was a it was a problem. Um, you know the mold and 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 the 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 the, the, um, uh, the, the mildew just to, the smell in the house is is has been you know it's not getting any better. Um, uh, and and that's that's a problem. Uh, the asbestos in the house, uh, et cetera. Um, and we we've got um, uh, you, you there's a there's a time where we need to do a better job of of saying hey this house cannot be uh, uh, rehabbed uh, it cannot be rehabbed uh, it can you can you know, you can put a lipstick on a on a you know I don't, I don't like using this but a lipstick on a pig and you can kind of paint over stuff and you can kind of uh, 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 you cover stuff up, uh, uh, and, you know, make, but it, it's not, it doesn't make the house safer. It doesn't make the house uh, more livable. It doesn't uh, uh, create a, a home for, for our family. Um, 
Uh, and uh, certainly with having the kids, uh, you know, the, all the lead that's in that house uh, is, is, is also a problem. Um, so, uh, you know, all these things stack up. Uh, we will, we will uh, uh, go and, and, and get more information if that is what uh, you guys uh, are, are looking for and need, uh, you know, get the, obviously not just getting somebody who can write a report that we tell them what to write, but actually a, a, a solid uh, a structural engineer and, and a building engineer and, and work with the architecture architects that we have to make sure that you know, we actually give you a, a reports that are that are accurate and, and professionally uh, um, uh, written, um, so that uh, so that we can we can move on um, uh, on this because it, it, we've been doing this for over a year. Um, so uh, we we did try with the COA. We appreciate the, that, but once we got the, the builders involved and, and the experts involved, uh, we realized that the, that that it it wasn't possible to do not in this house. Thank you for the comments and the clarification. Commissioners, does anyone else have any comment? Do we want to make a motion? Go ahead, Commissioner Lundquist. I'll, I'll just make a quick comment, then I will move for a motion. I do want, I pulled up one of the pieces of co correspondence from a local architecture firm, and I feel for the owners, I mean, it's just critical to choose the right architect that knows old homes and has worked with the correct builder. So it is expensive. And going down a path with the plan when it doesn't, you know, it reflects the lot, not the house. But we do have reputable evidence that says a consulting engineer said a full structural design. It can be rehabbed, just not to coming down to uh, Michael's point. So we have comments that say one thing: I move that we recommend the staff report and deny the request to remove this from a historic contributing status. Thank you for the motion. Do I have a second? I have second that. Second. Okay, we have a second. Emily, can we please get a roll call vote? Commissioner Longquist. Aye. Commissioner Pollack. Aye. Commissioner Bergman. Aye. Commissioner Woodmeyer. Aye. Commissioner Nemo. Aye. Commissioner Everson? Recuse. Commissioner Hassenstab? Aye. Chair Schilling? Aye. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, uh, Ryan. Thank you, homeowners. Um, uh, I expect that we will have more conversations in the future. Um, but we appreciate the time and the attention and all of the input. Thank you. Okay. Um, that leads us to our next section of the meeting, which is correspondence and petitions. We did get a rather interesting, um, correspondence this week or this between between the this meeting and the last and emily do you want to present about this please you are muted emily thank you sorry i wanted to pull up a video that was also sent with that um correspondence i wasn't able to attach it to the packet because it's a video but i wanted to show it here tonight um the i received this email um from a student and he has um he's passionate about the railroad and he's doing some work um on a i believe um, a documentary he said the railroad and he came across this building and wanted to bring it to the heritage preservation commission's attention and so i told him tonight that i would share it with you um and so i will share the video here if i can get it it's just a video of um kind of how, when he, what the building looks like. Let's see if I can share it here. Here we go. Can you guys? Okay. 
Yep, we can see it. So this kid found this as he was doing research, he, he discovered this and then went and got video of this? Yes, that is my understanding. He found it when he was um, working on his project or working. Um, our high school, our high school uh, board members should be careful. Uh, it seems like we've got an up and comer here. <laughs> He's 10 years old, is that right? 10 or 11? Yeah, something like that. Wow. That's incredibly yeah. cool. Do we know exactly oh, where it's located? Yeah, it's cool. the, I was just going to ask that. It's, um, he told me. Just, yeah, he, go, go ahead, Annie. Them. No, go ahead. Um, he gave me kind of um, businesses that it's next to, so I have some of that information. I don't know. If, I'd have to go back and look, um, but he has that information. Um, he actually called before the meeting tonight, um, so I let him know that you guys would be discussing it tonight. Not discussing it, I should say, just, um, taking in his correspondence. Um, so he is aware that you guys are receiving it tonight. Perfect, Emily. So yes, we want to officially accept Ted's correspondence. Um, it's really interesting. And uh, I think that as a commission, we should uh, consult with our historic consultant Vogel to find out um, if there's further steps we need to take um, regarding this Atwood station, and uh, maybe we could reach out to Ted and he could give us some more information um, gathered about the railroads, and um, it might be interesting for him to work work with Ted to um, have him maybe present to us at some point. Chairman Schilling, I think Emily, if I'm not mistaken, his email asked for our don't know much. I found this, but I want your help to preserve it. I wonder if we've reached out the, to the historical society as a as a step. I think he's waiting to hear back from us. Um, yes, I think you're right. Uh, I would be happy to reach out to the historical society um, to find out if they have any interest in um, helping with the preservation, or at least. Um, well, I think it would be great, not so much from a help with the preservation, because I think that could, depending on what the situation is, that might still fall into our purview, but more of what information do they have, if any? Robert, is Robert still on the phone? Yes. Do you know anything about this? As a matter of fact, our firm has done numerous studies of various uh, components of the Dan Patch line. I actually think this little station shed might not be within the Dyna city limits. Uh, that's only because we we looked at the corridor as part of the Grandview overall environmental study, uh, and uh, the State Historic Preservation Office is not really responding to inquiries right now. But I put in a request for them to give me their inventory files. They inventoried every structure within the right of way of the way or from you know, Dakota County all the way up to the to the head end on 34th and Nicollet, I think is where it is. Uh, and we'll see if it shows up in there. But if it is in Edina, it'd be an interesting kind of thing to take a look at. This is uh, exactly what we've been talking about for forever, something well, like this. This is about the fourth or fifth railroad or streetcar related object that a member of the public has brought before the Heritage Preservation Commission or its predecessors, and I've gone out and tracked down. This is finally one from a, a young person, and frankly, the return on the investment of providing him with a written report, you know, is really high. <laughs> These are the people. Uh, yeah. I, story over and over again. I have a person on my staff. She's got her doctorate from Boston University. I talked to her as a sixth grader in St. Paul Park's middle school 
and uh, said she was kind of interested in public archaeology. You, you know what? I, I, I would hazard a guess, and forgive me, Chair Schilling, but I, I can't help myself. Um, I have no doubt in my mind that if we needed to find budget for us to figure out how Robert or anybody else from that we would need to pay to go look this through based on the story that we could give to the city council, um, it would take about three seconds for them to say, oh, yeah, here's the $500 or $1,000. Go. Well, we, we have we have consultant budget to take care of this kind of stuff. And it, it comes at an opportune time where oh. we're actually right on budget for the year. And this isn't going to cost you anything. Uh, but it would be nice to know. Uh, and if it's, I have a, I have a suspicion it's actually in, in St. Louis Park, but uh, if it turns out to be in Edina, we all get to do something about Don't it. Don't crush our dreams before we've had a chance, Robert. <laughs> Sorry, I, I have to kind of give you the, you know, none of cards and rainbows kinds of history. We got. But he says it's near the Twin Cities Produce, kind of down by the new Edina bus garage. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we'll look. Commissioner Lundquist, did you have something to add? I was just going to confirm what Sarah shared. It's by Twin Cities. Sort of made. And we could have a field trip when the quarantine lifts. Uh, it's right across the street from Wooden Hill Brewery. We oh. could meet there. <laughs> well, I'm oh. also thinking that this could be an, an interesting virtual. We could do a virtual field trip um that might coincide with our walking tour or at least our virtual activity that's on our work plan well may i make a motion that um based on what uh commissioner lundquist said i believe that we should draft a letter back to this resident um first to thank him for his studious nature and um, bringing this to our attention, we will immediately uh, look, start looking into it and we will report back to him judiciously once we are able to get more details from that standpoint. And then we would look forward to inviting him uh, to, to share that. As far as a report, Robert, are you actually offering to provide a report based off of this if it is something or I mean, we don't want to promise the kid the moon and not deliver? It's been our practice. Uh, since 20, well, since 2001, I guess, uh, that when especially young people take the time to actually make a request, we respond in writing and tell them what we can and awesome. not, not try to lead them astray or tell them something where we think rather than know. Right. Uh, this is a perfect example of that. Awesome. Uh, we, we get Cub Scouts and Girl Scouts who are trying to do some project uh, every now and then. Uh, Joyce always thought that was the most important part of our, our mission. So and I want to I want to modify my motion then. So now I do I want a letter coming from the city and for, on behalf of the Heritage Preservation Commission. So I don't know if that's something Emily you can do or the chair does or whatever it is. But then the second part of the motion is then directing our consultant to please do what's necessary to provide a written report for us and this young man uh, to find out what we find out. Well, uh, so thank you for the motion. motion. Do, I, do I have a second? Second. Emily, can we get a roll call vote on this, please? Yes, um, Commissioner Longquist. Aye. Commissioner. Aye. Commissioner Birdman. Aye. Commissioner Woodmire. Aye. Commissioner Nemo? Aye. Commissioner Ederson? Aye. Commissioner Hassenstab? Aye. Chair Schilling? Aye. Ted, if you're watching or um, uh, if you're seeing this as a recording, thank you very much for your work. And um, we're, we're really proud to have you as part of our community. Thank you. Chair Shilling, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Next action is uh, chair and member comments, under which we've got our 2020 work plan. Um, I will mention, oh, go ahead. Did you guys, um, the next was the um, preservation planning, if you guys wanted to continue with that oh. on the agenda tonight. 
I'm sorry, I missed that. I'm sorry, Robert. Okay. <laughs> so, Robert, like that we delay this until next month. Uh, two hours is long enough for an HPC meeting, and uh, this will take. This is actually the fun stuff in historic preservation. We should get you a little pressure. Um, we, appreciate, we appreciate that. So, someone wants to make a motion to continue I'm, it to the next meeting. So moved. Second. Do we have a second? Second. All right. Um, can we get a roll call vote, please? Yes. Commissioner Longquist. Aye. Commissioner Pollock. Aye. Commissioner Birdman. Aye. Commissioner Woodmeyer. Aye. Commissioner Nemo. Aye. Commissioner Everson. Aye. Commissioner Hassenstab. Aye. Chair Schilling. Aye. Okay. So let's move to the chair and member comment section uh, under which falls our 2020 work plan. I want to mention that I did present the work, our draft, uh, uh, our work plan to the city council this last week. Um, Emily will be uh, meeting with city council as well this upcoming week. Is that right, Emily? Um, um, yeah, we have an internal staff meeting to go over work plan. We'll be, um, staff will meet with city council early November. Okay, very good. Um, but there are some moving pieces. I know that Commissioner Lundquist has done some work. Uh, do you want to speak to that at all, Commissioner Lundquist? We decided to keep it brief because we had a full agenda. I just want to mention that Mark and Rachel and I have met. Our committee is looking at the properties that are on the eligible list to become landmarks to see if we could learn more, reach out to homeowners and make that happen, see if they're interested. But we'll wait until after more training from Robert because we'll add historic context and past outreach with citizens. I just wanna thank Rachel for putting together the spreadsheet that wasn't included in the packet. If any student members wanna join our group, please let Emily know. We'd love to have you if that's a topic that interests you. Wonderful. One of the things I will tell you all that I did mention to city council is what an engaged and um, energized and active commission we have currently. So I appreciate the work and all the leadership that's going on within our work plan. Thank you for that. Do I have any other um, member comments? Any Anyone want to make comments during this segment of our meeting? Sure, Shelley. I do have a question Go regarding 4600 uh, Browndale. What is the next recourse of action that can happen? Uh, I don't know if you or Emily can go through what options are next. I know we said we'd probably hear from the folks again. Um, can they just tear down the house? Could they show up with bulldozers and take it down? I seem to no. No. I'm, no. I, I mean, yeah, I Emily, you go ahead, but yeah, go ahead, Emily. Um, so their request for in front of the HPC tonight was denied um, with any decision that the Heritage Preservation Commission makes um, that decision can be appealed to city council is um, where a decision made by the HPC can be appealed. So um, I guess in the next 10 days, we'll find out if that decision is appealed. Um, they would they would not be able to demolish the house without you guys knowing about it. They would need a demo, a demo permit and that wouldn't be issued without a certificate of appropriate allowing that. So Emily, so the, just to be clear, so in 10 day, within 10 days, if they come back to you and they say, we're gonna appeal this um, and this is why, that would be kind of one, one avenue they could take or they could go through the whole kind of request again. Is that correct? Yes. So then I guess if they come and they say, we have expert A, B, C, and D. I guess what what tools does the city? Is it beyond our our reach at that point? I mean, we don't have the engineering experts on our staff to 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 say to to counter it. I guess what would be the city's next step if that were to be the case. Um, well, similar, to we had the building inspector walk through, or we requested the building inspector to look into um, the applicant or the application. I imagine it would be something like that, whatever information they provide. Um, 
I'd have the necessary staff review it and provide that information to you guys with a report. So if they appeal it in the 10 days, it goes right to the city council. Right. We don't see it again. Okay. But to be clear, the city council would then have everything that has transpired. So everything we said, our decision, all the correspondence, all the things that have happened, and I'm sure we'd give a nice long dissertation of the long history of what's happened and so on and so forth. So for those uninitiated, it's not as if like the city council wouldn't look at what we have. And while it's been very rare, even in my tenure, to see appeals done, um, I know for a fact, and I'm sure Robert could attest to this, that the city council is not prone to overturning what the HPC does. Um, it can, but it's not, it would take an extraordinary case. And I'm not quite sure this would fall into that category. The one, well, question I would, the one comment I would make, if I may, and this might be something just to, for us to think about, is that I look at this situation as it probably being a one-off to where you have um, a homeowner who bought something thinking one way and whatever advice they'd gotten or whatever it is, either wasn't good enough or they didn't heed it or whatever it might be. And they've kind of landed on where they've landed. Um, we don't have any preview over people when they buy properties, even though we, we've talked about this before. How do we educate people to make sure people know, hey, if you're going to buy this property in the district, you know, the covenants are there, the plan treatment is there, so on and so forth. And if you, you want to talk about this before you, you know, want to sink some money into it. Um, I know we try to promote as best we can, but if we felt we needed to do something more with this, I could see the city council coming back and asking. Well, how do we explain to people about what the rules are and so on and so forth? I'm not quite sure. I know we'd have a good answer, but I don't know what our answer officially would be to that. Thanks. Sorry, last last kind of question. This is very near and dear to kind of uh, probably a lot of our, our heartstrings here. Was there any discussion on 4602 and uh 4604 Browndale, Emily? Like, did they inquire about what they had done? as two very significant modifications that I think we've all kind of more or less come around to um, how they did things just as an option. I don't know if any material is shared with them or, or whatnot about what was done. Specifically, I'm thinking along the lines of 4602 Browndale. Um, I'm not sure if they reviewed the plans that were presented to the Heritage Preservation Commission, which are included in packets, which are on the city's website. You could go back and look at what plans were presented from a te technical standpoint, like what was approved or what was done with each project, how the insulated walls and everything. I'm not sure they have that information. That's not something that was requested. It's not something that um, I would know to speak on. Um, they were aware or they, I mean, similar to conversations that I've had with them in the past, and similar to conversations that I have with um, almost everyone that has a request in the Country Club District, they're aware of the 50% um, the and what they have to keep to be considered a remodel and not a new home. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for sharing all that information with me before I purchased the home here as well, Emily. <laughs> You're not going back. <laughs> I just wanted to say um, say a quick note from what Michael just talked about, which is, you know, to the extent that it becomes a question of are we doing enough to educate homeowners as they are in the process of buying a home in the country club district, you know, that may be a like a, a, a work plan item for future years to think about as someone who's reviewed title work on a number of properties, you know, quite often if it's in some sort of special district you would see something recorded against the property that would say that would alert future homeowners who are buying it in their title work that you know this property is subject to x y and z and this is the process uh you know that the city mandates in general terms and i you know i think we had talked about that a few months back um and maybe mark i can't remember if you're the one that weighed in and said i didn't see anything like that in my title work when i bought so that may be an avenue that we might want to think about in future years to make recommendations as to whether or not we think the city should look at, uh, you know, putting something, recording something against uh, every property in the country club district, uh, you know, memorializing the fact that it's, you know, subject, uh, you know, to these, uh, this designation. Rachel, Go ahead. I would love, I would love. 
do that because it does no longer convey with the title, you're right. And the Country Club Neighborhood Association is no longer a legal entity, so it cannot through us. So exploring if it does through the city would be great. I do know that I did um, an outreach presentation to Edina Real Estate when they do their monthly meetings to this point, just to be sure awareness was there, but that needs to be repeated. So I think that would be a great thing to add. Um, if we could pivot, I had a question on process for Robert, and this riffs off Michael's earlier statement of what are we looking for, what information. My question, Robert, is do you know, um, let's say the applicant came back with additional structural engineering objections and concerns, the city would send their own staff. Are there precedents that third party, um, more neutral, Experts, I mean, what do other cities do? Is uh, it typically just the applicants engineer and the city staff, or is there precedent for others weighing in without getting too ridiculous or expensive? I'm curious. Well, the most common scenario is uh, an HPC finds itself in this predicament and they retain a firm like ours. <laughs> um, there is also an opportunity here to work with our federal and state partners. Uh, the district is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, the State Historic Preservation Office has a, a professional staff, a very small one, uh, but it does include a preservation architect and I believe an engineer at the time. And they do uh, weigh in on some of these issues sometimes. Uh, and to go back to a previous question, the most likely place for this to go if it's appealed and the, the COA denial ends up in front of the, the city council is the lawyers are going to caution against, you know, going forward with it because Minnesota has this thing called the Minnesota Environmental Rights Act, which if you feel that the city isn't even following its own rules, about historic properties in particular, uh, it becomes actionable. And Lord knows we don't need any more of that. Uh, so, I mean, it's it's probably going to bounce back to you if there is an appeal or if there is another uh, sort of a take a second shot at uh, uh, getting it reevaluated. Uh, uh, this isn't over um, either way. Uh, but there are there are uh, some low cost sources of technical and professional expertise. Uh, there's well, there's no there's no shortage of preservation firms and architects in the twin. Anybody who's ever worked in Stillwater will have an opinion on how to deal with vitreous tile and brick walls. Uh, and uh, yes, yeah, so you could solicit some of that without incurring any great cost to the I mean I have a historic architect on my staff uh, if he really needed a, a licensed architect's opinion with relevant expertise in this area we would be happy to make it available but uh, generally though the the responsibility for proving that the building is either not a historic preservation resource or is too deteriorated to be safe is up to the applicant, not the HPC or the building department. Yeah, um, I don't want to speak for the building official, but um, I believe he'd need something from a licensed engineer, engineer, um, structural engineer, saying that the structure would need to come down for him to, you know, he wouldn't make that decision on his own. He'd be um, looking for additional information. By by practice, uh, we've always deferred to the chief building official's opinion. You know, if he decides based on what he sees that a building is unsafe, we don't challenge that opinion. That's that's a slippery slope for Heritage Preservation Commissions to land on. And he's been very good uh, whenever we've asked him to be involved in one of our little little projects that becomes controversial. He's also an excellent, and he's worked with historic stuff before. So I mean, it's it's uh, but it's his call, not certainly not mine and, and uh, yeah 
Thank you for asking that question, Jane. I was going to ask it earlier and I never got around to it. So I'm glad you asked that. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, Emily, do you have any staff comments tonight? I do not. Okay. Um, which leads us to needing a motion for adjournment. Would anyone like to so move motion? Anyone second? Second. Okay, Emily, can we get a roll call, please? Yes. Um, Commissioner Longquist. Aye. Commissioner Pollock. Aye. Commissioner Birdman. Aye. Thank you. Good night. Commissioner Commissioner Woodmeyer. <laughs> Aye. Commissioner Nemo. Aye. Commissioner Everson. Aye. Commissioner Hassenstab. Aye. Chair Schilling. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Thank Have a you. good night. Thank Thanks, everybody. Emily? Yes. Did you figure out what the, that the issue was with the email? I, sorry, hold on one second. <laughs>